This is Radio 4. It's half past three. Now we come to the first programme in our series Conversations with Historians, in which John Miller meets several eminent historians to discuss their work, why they were drawn to it, and why they feel it's relevant to the modern world. Sir Michael Howard has been saluted as the outstanding military historian of his generation. The experience of war preceded his study of it. He joined the Coldstream Guards in 1943, won the Military Cross at Salerno, and was wounded twice before the war was over. He returned to read history at Oxford, but his special interest in the study of war was awakened when he was asked to write the history of his regiment. He created the Department of War Studies at King's College London and co-founded the International Institute for Strategic Studies. His knowledge and insight have influenced historical and military thinking on both sides of the Atlantic. Now teaching at Yale, I caught him on a brief trip home, where he remembered the first unease about the title of his new discipline. We had a lot of debate about it, as to what it should be. The decision was taken. I very well remember the meeting of the, of the committee concerned. As a result of an intervention by that great Yorkshireman and diplomatic historian, Sir Charles Webster, who was a very formidable figure. And after we had said, should it be military studies, should it be strategic studies, should it be war and peace studies, he hit the table with his great mutton chop of a fist and said, it's about war, isn't it? We'll call it war studies. And there was a stunned silence at war studies, it then was. Then, of course, people said, well, what about peace studies? And so we said, yes, well, what about peace studies? Absolutely fine. I regard it rather as if one sees a chessboard as being black on white or white on black. Both are studying fundamentally the same phenomena. In your book, Studies in War and Peace, you quote Voltaire, the art of war is like that of medicine, murderous and conjectural. Is that a view you share? Another great debate is war an art or is it a science? And it was, I think, resolved by Clausewitz, who said, well, it's a little bit of both, but what it is primarily is it is like business. It is the interaction of great groups of people trying to achieve dominance, conducting politics with an admixture of other means. Up to a certain point, it can be scientifically studied. Up to a certain point, it can be exercised with considerable skill. It is certainly, alas, murderous. It is to a very considerable extent conjectural, but part of its fascination is that it is a hugely complicated, difficult and controversial activity, which I think one can go on studying indefinitely and find out new things about it. Some of the figures who are influential in this area are also controversial, like Little Hart. He said, if you want peace, understand war. That, I think, is one of the less controversial things he ever said. That was an extraordinarily wise remark, and which, I, which I constantly quote, that um, if you don't understand the roots of conflict and why people fight one another, uh, you are not going to be able to live at peace with one another. Clausewitz is a name which crops up more than any other in all, in all your books, but for Little Hart, he was a false prophet. Did he misunderstand him? Yes, he didn't really study him very deeply. Little Hart was writing at a time, uh, he, 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 he wrote over several decades, but when he was uh, attacking Clausewitz, it was between the wars at a time when Clausewitz was seen as being identified with A, the German way of making war, and B, uh, with the kind of war which had been fought in World War I. Among other things which Clausewitz did say was that most wars can really only be settled by major battles, and major battles are always murderous and conjectural. But that is not a good reason for avoiding them. Now, Little Hart, like most of his generation, picked that up and said, it is because of what Clausewitz said that we had things like the Battle of the Somme, which was a absurd distortion, actually, of, of what Clausewitz wrote. The remarkable thing about Clausewitz was that from his observation of war during his lifetime, which roughly spanned the Napoleonic Wars, he was able to derive insights and lessons and theories 
which have continued to be relevant even into the nuclear age. Did his influence shape the Prussian approach to the Franco-Prussian War? Uh, His influence, yes, yes it did, in this way, that the Prussian army was trained by General von Moltke, who was Clausewitz's first professed disciple. And among the many other things which he learnt from Clausewitz, was that once a battle is engaged, you really cannot have any influence over its conduct. All does depend upon the skill, uh, the insights, and the bravery of junior commanders. By 1870, when you have these huge armies which railroads made possible, a commander-in-chief was bound to be miles behind the front line. That war was planned by the Prussians over a long period, So much so, it now appears to have been inevitable, was it? Nothing is inevitable in history. There are various degrees of probability. The Prussians had contingency plans for wars against all their major adversaries, their neighbours, the Russians, the Austrians, the French, all the people they were likely to fight. To that extent, they were able to reach into their files and say, OK, here's the plan for the war against France. But the war was probable in that... There had been in Germany, and in particular Prussia, a resentment, an annoyance, a dislike, a hatred, almost, of the French, ever since the Napoleonic invasions of Germany. And it had been felt that the defeat of Napoleon had not really humbled the French, that sooner or later the French were going to make trouble again, and that Germany would only really be a major power once they had shown they could defeat the French. The Prussian army was more up-to-date than the French, but both sides mistakenly thought that cavalry would be decisive in the great set-piece battles. Yes, they did. There are psychological reasons for this. In the first place, one must remember that before the invention of the, the internal combustion engine, the horse provided the only element of mobility on the battlefield at all and was uh, vital for the movement of armies, vital for all kinds of things like reconnaissance, harassing, all the things which one now does with anything from armoured cars to to aircraft. So cavalry was quite rightly seen as a major element within any army. However, there was a sort of um, psychological thrust on the part of cavalry officers, dating from the historic days when battles were won by great cavalry charges against other groups of cavalry, when the cavalry was the queen of the battlefield. And cavalry officers, almost up to our own day, perhaps even in our own day, have always been unsatisfied with the idea, our job is reconnaissance, our job is harassing the flanks, our job is charging with providing the actual root input to victory. There's something sexual about it, quite honestly. So, Michael, you you end your book on the Franco-Prussian War by describing Germany's brilliant victory as, in a profound and unforeseeable sense, a disaster for herself and for the entire world. What did you mean by that? I meant that it did lead the Germans to overestimate the importance of military affairs in international relations. Several generations of Germans were brought up seeing the great Prussian victories over France as being not only the foundation of German power, but fundamentally the way in which German power was going to have to be exercised in future. Uh, They saw those victories as a paradigm for Germany's position in the world. It did reinforce what I talked about a little earlier, which was the hegemonial position which the military occupied they had occupied in Prussia, they were now going to occupy it in Germany as a whole. A paradoxical situation, with Germany as becoming the leading industrial technological power, but at the same time dominated by this archaic militarism. And it is this combination of industrial, technological, scientific progressiveness huge increase in productivity and wealth combined with this archaic militarism which did create the German problem which created two world wars. We've often been taught that it made the First World War inevitable. You were arguing earlier that you weren't sure that anything was that inevitable but 
How do you, how do you feel about that cause and effect? There are so many uh, reasons why the war happened, so many causes for it. Fundamentally, it was two wars. It was a conflict between Germany and Britain with Germany challenging Britain's hegemonial position in the world. There had been an influential, powerful lot of Germans in the 10 or 15 years before the war who had targeted Britain, that until Britain has been destroyed and has been humbled, Germany will never be able to attain the full position which destiny has charted out for her in the world. There was the second element of the war, which was the war of the Austrian succession. Was the Habsburg Empire going to survive, or was it going to get broken up? And if it did get broken up, who were going to be the inheritors? Would not the breakup of the Austrian Empire mean an enormous increase in the power of Russia? And Russia was beginning to be seen, particularly in Germany, as the menacing superpower of the future. And Germany goes to war, Germany accepts the war, uh, in many, in many instances with great enthusiasm, partly because they feel that this is our chance to make clear our right to be a Weltmacht, a world power, a superpower, and partly because they felt if they didn't fight then, Russia would become so strong within the next three or four years that Germany would be overwhelmed by a power potentially far greater than her own. Clausewitz suggested that policy could convert the heavy battle sword of war into a light, handy rapier for use in limited conflicts. But was that difficult to apply to the mass armies of 1870 and 1914? Well, those armies were designed to fight one another in conflicts which could only be total. A limited war between France, Germany, Russia, Habsburg Empire was almost unthinkable. I mean, these were going to be wars in which the only object could be victory in order to retain or assert a, hege a new hegemonial position. Smaller wars were fought fairly effectively by the British. The British army was really, and still is, quite a useful rapier, but would not be very effective in a major conflict. But after the failure of the Schlieffen plan to achieve a quick knockout victory in, in France in 1914, were the military disasters of the next three years caused by the failure to learn the right lessons from military history? Well, the trouble about lessons of military history, like lessons of history uh, of any kind, is that it's, you only know what they are in retrospect, that one can find in, in history arguments to justify almost everything that one, one is saying. Let us take the holocausts of Verdun and the Saab and the Passchendaele. And one wonders, why on earth did generals go on throwing manpower against barbed wire entanglements when they should have known uh, that it was not likely to lead to any, in, any result except massacre? The trouble was that they were able to look back to one or two instances, uh, indeed several instances, when it had worked. In the Russo-Japanese War, which was the war which was primarily in the mind of most commanders in 1914. It had only been fought ten years before. It had been fought with all modern weapon systems between two major powers. There had been horrendous casualties, but they had led to victory. Now, I think that if, in fact, the Battle of the Somme had achieved its objective, had uh, broken the German army in France, had liberated Belgium, had brought about an end of the war in 1917, we would now forget about the casualties. We would say these were glorious sacrifices to achieve a worthwhile objective. It was not evident in advance that it was not going to work. And it is only looking back on the thing that we can say, well, they should have known, shouldn't they? But the statement, they should have known, is a very ahistorical judgment to make. You mentioned Passchendaele. The World War II bomber offensive has been described as the Passchendaele of the Second World War. Is that a fair analogy? Um, it's been described as such because it involved horrendous casualties for the, the bomber crews themselves, as well as inflicting great destruction on the Germans, and did not achieve its objective in eviscerating Germany and winning the war in the air, which was what bomber barons had hoped could be done. 
It did, however, have major contribution towards victory in that it forced the German air force onto the defensive. The German armies won their spectacular victories in 1939-41 because they had complete command of the air. Uh, the unfortunate armies at Dunkirk, Greece, France, elsewhere, were harassed and bombed from the air and were unable ever really to stand effectively and fight on the ground. From 1943 onwards, the Germans did not have command of the air over the battlefields, and the Allies did. Had it not been for that, we would never have got ashore at Normandy. We were scared stiff that the Germans were going to be able to achieve even a temporary command of the air, which would have made the landings impossible. So, in fact, I think that the bomber offensive did achieve a very, very necessary goal, although it was not that which the Air Force originally intended. But you've also argued that by 1943, Hitler had destroyed the independence of his generals and with it all chance that they could win his war. It's arguable that by that time, the war was unwinnable. The only way in which a stalemate could have been forced, and that I think was what an intelligence strategist would have been fighting for in Germany after, after, after the, the Americans are in, would have been to pull back to a defensible line in Russia and defend it. Hitler, however, was not interested in that. With Hitler, it was a matter of uh, victory or destruction. Uh, he was not interested in negotiated peace. Uh, that is what I meant when I said that he, he made it impossible for the generals, I won't say to win the war, but to bring the war to a halfway satisfactory conclusion. It must have been an advantage to Churchill that his control of the war machine was much more complete than Lloyd George's in the First World War. Oh, certainly. I mean, Churchill had learned his lesson from the First World War about how not to do it. The appalling... I can hardly call it a decision-making process, a sort of lack of decision-making process in World War I, in which you had a sort of orlic council of politicians in the cabinet, none of them with any military experience at all, trying to confront strong-minded and um, obstinate generals and admirals who thought they knew what to do. That was not the way in which Churchill was going to do it. Churchill ensures that he has a strong political base in the House of Commons, that his cabinet colleagues are given jobs to do in running the economy, uh, which he leaves them to get on with, but that he runs the war together with his military advisers. And he doesn't take his military advisers all that seriously. He bullies them, he forces them to justify every single project which they put up, he bombards them with ideas, he gives them absolute hell. But fundamentally, he is the man in charge and everybody knows it. And that, if you... If you can achieve that situation, it's much easier to run a war. How frequently do statesmen face a severe moral dilemma in wartime? In a way, once you are involved in a war at all, you are involved in moral dilemmas, because war is about killing people. And not only about killing people, but ordering other people to get killed. And every single military commander and politician in charge is set in authority over them, faces a moral dilemma every time they order people into action, every time they order the destruction of enemy personnel, property, or, or whatever. If they were to really sort of agonise over every single decision which they, they had to take about its moral justification, they would not be able to make war at all. Well, it could be argued they should not make war at all. But uh, my own philosophy is, I, I did start life as an adolescent pacifist, but World War II at last showed that if you are not prepared to make war, you do abandon the affairs of the world to those who are prepared to make war. In the causes of wars, you point out that Kissinger was an historian before he was a statesman. Was that the secret of his success, do you think? I think it helped an enormous amount. In the first place, it did give him a broad perspective on the problems of international relations. His field of study had been the reconstruction of Europe after the Napoleonic Wars, and that provided a pattern of 
international relations of power politics, which seemed to him a very much more valid and useful one than the pap pattern of simple straight confrontation between us and them. In the second place, as a historian he had learnt, and this is, I think, one of the great things which history does teach one, that different cultures think in different ways. They have different mindsets. They mean different things by, from what they say. That the Russians were coming to international politics from a Russian base. Uh, so were the French, so were the British. And he was therefore able to understand what were the preconceptions, the hang-ups, the prejudices, the difficulties, which confronted the statesmen with whom he was dealing. And his great strength, as everybody pointed out, was his skill in getting alongside his, his, his adversaries and telling them, explaining to them why they had these problems in a way which they found very convincing. Uh, he treated the Russians and everybody else as if they were sensible adults. And that was not the way in which John Foster Dulles had done it. When you said in that book that those who do not change their minds in the course of a decade have probably stopped thinking altogether, what major aspects have you changed your mind about? That is a, a very difficult question because I think I'm changing my mind the whole time. Um, on the whole, of course, I am proudest of the things which I have not changed my mind about. I think I was always fairly good on seeing that the Russian threat had been hugely overrated by the West. But at the same time, I did share the general prejudices, I think, of the, of the Cold War years, which did make it difficult for one to realise the extent to which third world pressures for independence were fuelled much more by old-fashioned nationalism than by new-fangled Marxism. I have written fairly repeatedly, and I haven't changed my mind about this, that historians can only see things through the eye of their own generation and that the history which I have written will be seen in future as a kind of history which somebody of my background, of my period, and of my culture was bound to write and can't escape from it. You've even wondered whether today military history still exists or should exist as a distinct field of study. I've always been worried about the concept of military history as a, a ding and zish, a thing in itself, uh, something to be studied in isolation. I think that history with military history left out has got a huge important hole in the middle. I think that military history studied simply in isolation is something for children, quite fr frankly. It is a sort of extension of war gaming. And I think that this is not only inadequate, I think it is dangerous. I, I think that to regard war as simply an extension of a war game, which so many people did during the Gulf Crisis, shows a kind of moral deficiency, that war is, is terrible. War is a realm of moral evil. War involves making appalling decisions. War involves inevitably doing wrong and should not be undertaken, should not be studied, unless that is, is thoroughly understood. And I think that one of the the main functions of historians of war is constantly to be hammering that lesson home. What is the true use of history? Oh, it has many. And the function of the historian is to ensure that it is right, that it is not myth. Because if you have a historical myth which makes you believe that you are racially superior to other people, that um, there is an inevitability about the historical process, which means that the dictatorship of the proletariat is going to lead to the classless society. Uh, one could go on with this sort of shopping list of myths. You are going to act wrong. You are going to commit appalling political and other errors. One of the lessons, if you like, which does seem to repeat itself over and over again, certainly has uh, over the last 200 years, is that when people try to produce a utopia through revolution, they produce hell. That the attempt to apply 
ideal solutions to immensely complex political situations in an attempt to remedy patent evident injustices almost always produces a society far less just than that which the revolution attempted to overthrow. Now it is easy, I think, for me to see this, belonging to a generation which the whole of my life really has been overshadowed by the Russian Revolution and by two world wars. One can see the way in which the, the Russian Revolution turned out. But I'm very conscious of the fact that generation very slightly senior to my, myself, those who came to maturity in the 1930s, unlike the 1940s, were able to believe that this time mankind would get it right, that the Russian Revolution would produce a new and conflict-free society in which justice would rule. I was also very conscious that a rather younger generation, those who came to maturity in the 1960s, were also able to believe, as their activities in 1968 showed, that it would be possible to go from an ideal vision of society to reality through simply destroying what was e existing there. You will no doubt meet historians, you may indeed have met them, who do not have the kind of disillusioned attitude towards revolution which I have. I love Jacob Burkhardt's definition of history, which you've quoted, that it's not to make men clever for next time, it's to make them wise forever. But when one talks about wise old men, wise old men are usually people who say, don't do it, I've done it, it didn't work. Occasionally, the sort of the less wise young people say, well, I think it might work this time. Let's have a go. Would you go further? Do you believe that the study of history creates the morality of mankind? I believe that we have progressed a long way beyond our ancestors in terms of our morality. That is to say, when we regard slavery as being wrong, we are right. And that the Romans and others, I mean, and, and the, uh, the whole of mankind up till the 18th century, which accepted slavery, which did believe that it was legitimate to burn heretics or to, or to burn witches, we can judge them from a superior moral position and say they were wrong in exactly the same way as we can judge the Nazis and say they were wrong when they exterminated Jews. If you do not believe that, then everything is morally relative and we have no moral standards whatever. If we say that, uh, ah, well, uh, in the Middle Ages it was understandable they should burn heretics, that was the way in which they looked, looked at things, and who are we to judge? You then have to say, well, it is understandable that the Nazis gassed Jews, that was the way in which they looked at things, and who are we to judge? I think somebody who abdicates that situation is quite frankly contemptible. We are now living through a fascinating period of moral revolution in which not only racial hegemony is, is no longer acceptable, I don't think it, it has not really been for 50, 50 years or so, but 100 years ago it was, but the position of women in society, attitudes towards sexual deviance, all these things are forcing a new evaluation of uh, what our moral values should be. And this moral change is the historical process. It is the result of the historical process. We are living through it. We are making it ourselves. In the first of his conversations with historians, John Miller has been talking to Sir Michael Howard, Professor of War Studies at Yale University. The producer was John Knight. This is Radio 4.